Warning! Tube amplifiers have lethal voltages inside them. Please do not attempt to build, test, or repair these without understanding and following all safety protocols. Hey y'all! Well, we're here for the last of the build series on this, and we're going to solder up the few components that were left, which we'll go into in the video, and I don't think we'll be able to combine this the voltage testing and the audio analyzer suite but let's see what happens let's see how long this takes so let's get busy okay so we're winding up our little build here and i went ahead and installed these coupling caps on the model block that we're doing the slow build series on this is the one we built first and this is the one we built second as you can see, these are mirror images of each other. So like I said, I went ahead and soldered in these coupling caps that go from this plate over to the grid, and then from the cathode over to the grid, and I'll zoom in later and show you a little more detail of that. So we've got a few parts left to install. We need to ground the output transformer over here to our star ground point, and this is really important if you're using global negative feedback because it won't work if you don't have the negative of the output transformer hooked to the signal ground or the star ground point. So we need to run that wire across here. We need to run the feedback resistor from the 16 ohm cap over here to the cathode of the input tube. And then put our capacitor across it, a little 100 PF. Then we need to wire up the LED on the power switch. And I know there's ways of just directly hooking it to the 6.3 volt, but I like rectifying the power going to the power LEDs to give them the longest life they possibly could have because LEDs really aren't designed to be rectifier diodes. And so I like these little NTE5332 rectifiers. And we're going to solder that across the heaters with a little cap and then run the wires up here to the power LED. And then the last thing that I want to install in these, and I'll show you a close-up of this. And this is a little XY cap that goes across the power switch, which in the past I've just used a film cap, but some of the viewers explained to me the reason that you want to use these XY safety caps. And so... I bought a, a bunch of those to use on my projects, and we're going to put one of those like this across both the power switches. And the reason we put these in is so that when you turn the amp off, it doesn't make a pop in your speaker. So let's go ahead and get these parts soldered in. Then we can go ahead and check our voltages on both of these amps, and then we can compare them on the scope and the audio and analyzer suite. And then I can go listen to them and see what they sound like. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is put this ground wire and we're going to go from our star ground point over here to the negative or the common of the output transformer, which will be the negative speaker jack. So let's go ahead and get this wire soldered in place. First we'll come in and solder this side in. Then we'll come in and solder this side in place. And there we got our ground wire hooked up. So then the next piece we want to do is come down here to the other end of the amp. Then we need to put in the feedback resistor that goes between this terminal and this end terminal on this tag strip for the input tube. Let's go ahead and get this soldered in place on this end. Then we'll solder it in on this speaker terminal here. I mean, it takes a little bit of heat to heat these back up, but nothing like it did originally to get the solder to flow into it. So I'm not con too concerned about like melting the plastic insulators on this. Just heat it up just enough to get the wire soldered in place or the resistor soldered in place. 
And there we go. Next we come in and put the little 100 PF cap across the resistor, like so. And solder it in place. And of course it's going to fight me a little bit. And let's go to the other side. And then come in and trim off the excess. And there we go. So next, let's connect this little rectifier, the capacitor, then run the wires over here to the LED on the power switch. Now make sure you look at the rectifier closely. It'll probably take a magnifying glass. Let me see if I can zoom in here with the camera where you can see these markings on it. And you can see one side has the two little squiggles. That's the AC, and then it has the negative and the positive of the output. So you want to make sure that you put the two little squiggly things towards the AC. So trim these leads on the little bridge rectifier off just a touch. And then come in and get it soldered to one of the tag strips. And then the other. to make sure it's got a, a good connection to both of them. Then the next little piece is you look at the find the negative and the positive and make sure you're putting the negative of this cap in the right direction. Bend the leads kind of like that so it's got a, a good angle to connect these up with and then I'm going to put a little plyo bond on the tip of this and glue it to the chassis and this will hold the cap in place and also help support this little bridge rectifier where it needs to sit. And the way this glue works best, put a little bit on one part and transfer it over to the other piece, which is the case. So we got a little dot of glue right there. We got a little dot of glue on the end of this cap. And then wait just a minute for it to tack up. And then when you put it together, just on contact, it'll glue together well enough to hold it in place while we solder this together. And then as it sits overnight, it cures and it makes a really good bond. Let me drop our cap right down there. Just like that. We can come in here and solder both of these up. There we go. So now we have some filtered DC to go up to our LED over here. The next thing we need to do is run the wires from here along over here to these two terminals and then put a resistor in one of the legs to get the illumination at the right amount that I want to see on the switch so it's not blinding. So I've determined through trial and error that a 3.3K resistor works good on these little switches to illuminate them at a nice brightness level. So first we put our resistor to the end of this wire and we're going to solder this to the end of the positive, although you can do it on either leg. It doesn't matter whether you put the resistor on the positive or the negative lead. I'm using my little my little alligator clip things there to hold it while I solder it. And then we come in and we get a little piece of heat shrink tubing, trim it off, put it over the resistor. And then this is the little technique I use to shrink my heat shrink tubing is just use this that part of the soldering iron where there's no solder on it to heat the tubing up and shrink it. And that just kind of 
help support that solder joint so it's not just an open joint sitting out there. And then we want to solder this onto, actually let me turn the amp around, I think we'll get a better view of this switch. And it might be kind of hard to see on this camera angle, but there's a terminal over here, back in this corner here, that's one of the LEDs, and then this is the other one. And you need to get a magnifier and look here at the end of the switch and look for the positive and negative marks. So you make sure you're wiring this up right because they are polarity sensitive. If you hook them up backwards, it won't light up. So let me go ahead and trim off the excess of this right now because it's going to be hard to get to once I solder this onto the end of this terminal. And actually, I think I'm going to put a little, little hook on the end of this resistor so it'll help it stay in place while I try to solder it. And I think originally these little switches had some sort of a, a plug that would plug onto the end of them, but I'm buying them just on eBay, and they don't come with anything, so I'm soldering the wires onto it. And there's our positive. Bend that down. I'm going to bring that along here, and it's going to come up like that. So now that we got this soldered in place, we're going to bring this over. And this, this side over here is the positive. So we'll trim that off. And then we'll get our negative. And this is a case where I am using a lot smaller than 18 gauge wire. I'm using some 22 gauge flexible wire because obviously this doesn't have much if any current going through it. Solder the negative side onto the switch. And obviously this step here is only if you're using these kind of little push-on angel eye switches like I like using on my amps. Solder it to the positive side of this. Then bring our negative over. It probably wouldn't hurt anything to kind of, even though these aren't AC, just make it a little neater to kind of twist these around each other so they'll it'll stay in place. We have to put a little dab of glue over there too to kind of just tack this over to the side of the case there. And then we'll bring our negative in and connect it like that. Strip the end of that off. Pin the end of this wire. And then tack it here to this other lead. And there we go. And like I said, I may come back here with a little hot glue or contact cement and tack this power wire going to the LED down just to make it a little neater looking. And then we'll be all done. So let's go over the final wiring on this power switch. These two small wires go to the illumination LED. And they come down here. We got a little hot glue from a hot glue gun here. Comes over to this rectifier with a filtering cap. Then this is the XY safety cap that goes across the 120 volts that helps eliminate the pop when you turn off the amp. And let me zoom in here and show you what this looks like. And as you can see, it's soldered across the two 120 volt wires. There's the ground. And then let me rotate the amp up and see if you can see the other LED. And you can see where the other LED lead hooks up and there's the resistor that we soldered onto the end of the wire. And then the last thing I was going to show you that I soldered in off camera was the coupling caps. This comes from the plate. It goes over to the grid of the output tube. And then this coupling cap goes from the cathode of the phase inverter over to the grid of this other output tube. And this one's doing the negative waveform, has the brown wire. This one's doing the positive, has the blue wire. 
Let me zoom in here and show you this connection. As you can see, this is the plate. This right here is the grid, this resistor, and then over here is the cathode of the phase inverter. So that's all the wiring inside the amp. Let's power this thing up and check the voltages. Okay, so we're ready to power this thing up and check our voltages. We have the voltage set on DC here, and we've checked our input voltage and through the variac with our isolation transformer, I got 122 volts on the input of the amp, which is normally about what my wall voltage is set at. So let's power this deal up. And our little LED comes on, and let's watch the DC voltage come up. And as you can see, we get about 400 volts, a little over, which is why we use 450 volt caps. But then once the tubes start drawing current, the voltage drop across the rectifier. Bring the voltage down. Let's just let this run for a minute. And we get right at 330 volts B+. 328.9 basically or 328.5 it kind of bounces around there so we'll just round that up to 330 that's about what you should be seeing now let's go to the plate of the output tubes and we're seeing 320 volts and the other one is 322 which is pretty normal to see a little variation between the two. It's actually 320, almost 321. So we're going to write down 321 for our plate voltage with the 270 ohm resistor. So if we got 321 here, the screen is 319 and a half, which is what I like seeing. Just screen should be just a couple of volts below the plate. There's 322, there's 318. Get about a little over two volts on that one difference. There's 320, 318.5. and a half. So a little less voltage difference between those two tubes, but the main thing, like I said, I like seeing the screens just a touch below the plates. So let's see what we got on the cathode here. On this tube we got 10.65 and 10.65 so we got the exact same voltage on the cathode of both these tubes which is the bias point so we'll put 10.65 down so the other thing I want to measure is the voltage coming over to the input tube we got 316 and then we'll see what the voltage on the plate of the driver tube is right at 90 volts and then on the cathode, 0.9 volts. So those are showing us the voltages that we have on these tubes. We can go ahead and check the phase splitter. The cathode is 90.3. Grids a little over a volt less. And on the plate, we're seeing 225. Okay, so I'm going to unplug this one, hook up the other amp, and see what kind of voltages we get on it with the different cathode resistor. Okay, let's power the second one up and see what the voltages come out to on it. And here comes up our B+. Plus. Again, goes right over 400 volts. And once the output tubes start conducting... We'll see our voltages drop. And we're expecting to see just a little higher B plus on this one because the tubes aren't going to be pulling quite as many milliamps. And it looks like we're right at 335 on the B plus, which is a few volts more than the other amp, which is kind of what I suspected would happen because the B plus is related to the voltage drop across the rectifier tube 
which is directly related to how many milliamps the amp is pulling through the rectifier tube. So let's come over here and see what the plate is on this output tube with the 330 ohm resistor and a little higher voltage. We got 327 versus 321, almost 328. Let's see what this other tube's at. 328.5. So we'll split the difference and average that uh, 328 on the plates of these tubes. Let me write that down. Okay. Let's see what our screen voltages are. 324, 325. And again, all I really like seeing is the screen voltage being just a breath lower than the plates. So we'll call that 325. Okay, so let's come in here and see what the cathode is with these larger value resistors. There we go, 11.68. On this tube, 11.74. That's almost a, a whole volt different in the bias. So let's average those, say 11.7 on that. And this should be pretty similar. But let's see what our voltages are on our input tube. We got 321 versus 316, which makes sense given there's less voltage drop across the rectifier tube. That's that's only 5 volts higher, B plus, on both sides of this resistor. So let's write that down. There's 321. And we'll just run through all these voltages. 223 on the plate. 97 on the cathode. These are on the phase splitter. And you got 95. And you want to see a little less voltage on the grid than the cathode. And that's the bias, the difference between this voltage and this voltage is the bias on the phase splitter. Got some negative voltage on the grid, so that's good. Then on the cathode of the input tube, got 0.9 volts. The grid should be zero. And then on the plate, it's that same 95 volts. So the input tube and the phase splitter seem to be basically unaffected by the change in the resistor on the cathode of the output tubes. So I'm going to sit down and do the math, figure out what the percentage of wattage of the output tube is being used on the two different resistors, see if we're in safe range, and then we'll hook this thing up to the audio analyzer suite and run both the channels and see what the difference between the two is. Well, as you can see, we got both of these push-pull amps all finished. Got the voltages checked, and the voltages are, for all extents and purposes, identical except for the output tubes on one versus the other. One of them has 330-ohm cathode resistors in them, and the other one has 270 ohm cathode resistor. And so in the next video, we will go into the audio analyzer suite, how they test against each other, and how much difference that really makes. We're not seeing a whole lot of difference in the voltage and the dissipation. There's about 5% difference between the 330 ohm and the 270 ohm. And it depends on what data sheets you look at. Some data sheets rate these tubes at 12 watts and some rate them at 14 watts. And I think some of them may be combining the screen with the plate. I'm not sure exactly what's going on, you know, why some of them are rated different than the other. If you rate them at 12 watts, one of them's running at 90% and the other one's running at 95%. If you rate them at 14 watts, one of them's running at 80, a little over 80%, and the other one's just a little over 85%. And so I've read people saying that a lot of amps run these tubes a lot harder than their max dissipation on the data sheets, and they seem to live. So I think there's a reason why people in amp builders run these things so hard is... There's got to be something to it. So anyway, we will find out in the next video what the differences are 
and I hope you're enjoying this build series. We really got to wrap this up. I need to get busy working on my friend's R8. So let's get this all wrapped up. If you're enjoying the channel, please sub to the channel. Please like the video. Don't get a lot of people liking my videos, even though I've got thousands of subs. I only get maybe 100 likes on videos. And so the more you like, the more this gets spread around, the more people will be able to find my channel. So it helps me out. Anyway, we're going to do the audio analyzer suite in the next day or two. Wrap this thing up. So we'll see you soon. Have a great day.